Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Exotic Astrology, and today we are delighted to have Ruchi with us. I was amazed when she was showing me the presentation today and yesterday. It is on timing of marriage. Welcome to Exotic Astrology, and she also has a beautiful YouTube channel, and she also has a Facebook page. So please go to her channel and subscribe, and you can also watch her videos. She has some videos in her channel. So welcome to Exotic Astrology and please share with us what you want to. Yeah, thanks Babaji for inviting me to your channel. I've been following you for a long time and I really love your videos as well. So I'm so honored to share uh, my presentation on your channel. Yeah, and I don't mean to exaggerate, but when she was showing me the presentation yesterday, I was thinking that uh, probably I have not seen any presentation like this in any corporate scenario. Forget about astrology and other domains like this. Even on a professional level, I have not seen. So it is amazing. I'm very sure you'll be delighted. So please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you can share the screen now, I guess. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> And yes, by the time you are sharing the screen, you can just uh, introduce yourself that how you got into astrology and anything else that you want to share. So I started uh, astrology when I was 16. Um, so my uncle was an astrologer and I learned everything there is to learn about astrology from him. And um, then I started with um, basically, so I started with a book, very simple basic book on sun sign and moon sign. And then then I started with charts of like other family members, friends, and then I started seeing patterns. And then I started like looking at more charts and then I started seeing more patterns. And that, um, that's how I started believing in astrology as well, that, okay, this is a science. This has, um, there is something that uh, our great sages have given us. So that's how I got interested in astrology. Yeah. And taking into consideration the current transits, especially the retrogression of Venus till November 15. So when uh, she suggested to me that we'll do a presentation on this topic, timing of marriage, I was like, yes, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So here is the presentation. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be talking about timing of marriage, how you can uh, check the timing of your marriage from your own birth chart. And I'm going to tell you um, if there's going to be early marriage in your chart or there's going to be delay. And towards the end, I'm also going to be suggesting some remedies that you can do if you have any issues in your marriage or if your marriage is not getting finalized. So that will be towards the end. So I'll start with like a very simple, basic thing that the first thing that you need to check uh, when you are checking the timing of marriage. So the first main thing is transit of current transit of the planets. So the planets that I'm going to be mentioning has to transit your rising sign, your second house, which is of family, home, and seventh house, which is for marriage, partnerships, and your 11th house, which is gains, wishes. So... So it should, uh, so I have a birth chart. So this is your rising sign. So why does the planet need to transit your rising sign? Because uh, your lagna is uh, seventh from your seventh house. So according to Bhavad Bhavam, uh, seventh from seventh is also capable of giving marriage. So the planet has to transit your second, your seventh and your 11th house. Now let's talk about which planets need to be transiting your house so you can check any three or more planets need to transit any of these house in any order or anywhere and they can be even in the same house so for example three planets in the seventh house three planets in the seventh house that is also fine so three planets in the second house that is also fine or three planets in the rising sign so which planets so the first thing is venus venus is the karaka for marriage for both males and females so if Venus is transiting any of these houses then or aspecting any of these houses, so for example, Venus is sitting in your eighth house, but still it can give you marriage because it's aspecting your second house. So Venus is the Karaka for both males and females. The second planet that we need to check is Jupiter. 
which is the karka of um, the karka husband for females so jupiter is also very important jupiter is like a guru it's like a priest so jupiter should again transit any of these uh, three houses and then the third planet is the rising sign or lagna lord so because again it's seventh from seventh so again the lagna lord so for example if it's an aries ascendant so mars should transit any of these houses to give marriage. And then one of the other planets is Saturn. Saturn is the planet of delay, but it's also a planet which teaches you responsibility and commitment. So if Saturn, for example, is transiting your seventh house, if this is Aries ascendant and seventh house, it's transiting uh, Libra, it's exalted. And this, so anyone uh, who has Aries ascendant has a good possibility of getting married when Saturn is transiting, again, any of these houses, but or aspecting any of these houses. So um, because Saturn is the planet um, that will definitely give you marriage, which I'll talk about double transit in my next slide. And uh, another planet, um, it's not actually a planet, but Rahu and Ketu, the nodes, the North Node and the South Node. And it's surprising because some people are like, how can Rahu and Ketu give you marriage? But it's actually wherever Rahu is transiting currently, it will create an obsession towards that house. So if Rahu is transiting your seventh house and Ketu is in the first house, Rahu will give you obsession. So all you can think about during that time is marriage if you are unmarried or uh, if you're married, then again, it will give you, bring you more closer to your spouse. So like, again, you will keep thinking about marriage. It will create an obsession. So again, Rahu and Ketu transit is also capable of giving you marriage. But again, that also depends on the Mahadasha and Antardasha, which we'll cover next. Um, so, okay, so we'll talk about double transit. So what is double transit? So two planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, when they are sitting in the same house or aspecting the same house, that gives double transit. And this is very potent. I've noticed like whenever Jupiter and Saturn is uh, double transiting, especially your second, seventh or 11th, this creates a very strong yoga for marriage. So I have a chart here, um, which shows uh, the double transit. So Saturn is transiting the Lagna and Jupiter is transiting the seventh house. They're both aspecting each other. So for Virgo ascendance, if, um, this, this transit is so potent that it can give you marriage. And then um, we'll talk about Ashtak Varga score. So this is a topic which can take five, six hours to cover, but I'll just cover it in short. Uh, so Ashtak Varga score, you get it printed uh, whenever you have your birth chart, you get it printed by the software. And it looks something like this. Each planet gives some points to each house in your birth chart. So then you see, um, so for example, in this chart, uh, the seventh house is getting 26 points. So uh, this is the table. So we'll just assume that this is an Aries ascendant. So you check the seventh house, you check the score, and then you check uh, the planets that I mentioned, how many points those planets are giving the seventh house. So whichever planets I mentioned, like Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, so just see how, and Rahu Ketu is not included in Ashtak Varga. So for example, um, this is Aries Ascendant. So I see that Mars is giving the highest score uh, to the seventh house, which is seven points. Anything more than four is good. And Mars is the Lagna Lord and Mars is giving seven points. So when this Mars transits the seventh house, it's capable of giving marriage to the individual. So again, like, it could be any of the planets that I mentioned before, whichever has the highest, even if two, three planets, are, so that is better, it will create like a more potent time for marriage. And again, you check the second house, seventh house and 11th house and see like any of these planets, how much score they're giving. So, you know, I remember how I said like, it could be three planets. So like we just check which three planets uh, are giving points based on this chart and then we figure out the exact timing we can pinpoint the exact time of marriage so now we'll go on to the next topic which is Mahadasha and Antardasha so planetary transits are there but if you are not running the proper Mahadasha or Antardasha you won't get married even if Mars is transiting your seventh house or even if the seventh lord is transiting your seventh house there needs to be this promise from the Mahadasha and Antardasha 
So which planets Mahadasha and Antardasha can give you marriage? So again, the same planets that I mentioned, um, it should be the seventh Lord, uh, Lagna Lord, same planets that I mentioned before, uh, Venus, Rahu, second Lord, 11th Lord. The another thing is planets in the seventh house, Mahadasha of planets in the seventh house. So for example, your seventh house has moon. So moon Mahadasha or moon Antardasha can give you marriage. Dispositor of the seventh Lord. So for example, your seventh Lord is Venus. And Venus is, let's say, sitting in Capricorn. So then again, the dispositor is Saturn. So again, like you need to take the dispositor into consideration. So any of these planets, Mahadasha or Antardasha, can give you marriage. Like Mahadasha and Antardasha are more potent, but again, there's like Pratyantardasha and, uh, but the main powerful thing is Mahadasha and Antardasha. Mahadasha Lord is powerful and then Antardasha Lord during that time will give you that thing. And again, conjunctions and aspects. So again, Mahadasha and Antardasha, so planets conjunct seventh Lord. So for example, let's take an example of Mercury. Mercury is not the second Lord, seventh Lord or 11th Lord. Mercury is not sitting in the seventh house, but Mercury is sitting with the seventh Lord. So if Mercury is conjunct Venus, Mercury is sitting with the seventh Lord. So again, Mercury, Mahadasha or Antardasha is capable of giving you marriage. And planets as aspecting seventh house. So for example, Jupiter is in your third house. Jupiter is aspecting your seventh house. Again, planets aspecting seventh house is also capable of giving marriage. And this is a very, again, this topic is so um, deep that it, it will take lots and lots of time to explain, but I'll explain in short the nakshatra of the seventh Lord. So for example, let's say uh, seventh Lord Venus is sitting in Mula Nakshatra, which is ruled by Ketu. Some people will be very surprised, but actually Mahadasha and, or Antardasha of Ketu can also give you marriage. Like I have seen in my personal, um, uh, I saw one of the charts of one of my family members, they actually got married in Ketu Antardasha. So if um, the seventh Lord is in Ketu's Nakshatra, even that can give you marriage or for example, if seventh Lord is in Jeshta, so again, the Nakshatra Lord is Mercury. So the, that can, uh, the Mahadasha or Antardasha of Mercury can give you marriage. So that's Mahadasha and Antardasha. So first you check the planetary transit, then you check if you have the promise of Mahadasha or Antardasha. Now there's another, I have um, talked about Gemini astrology. How can you uh, check for marriage through Gemini astrology? So there are two things that um, you need to check. One is Upa Pada Lagna and the another one is Dara Karaka. So, sorry. So Upa Pada Lagna. So what is Upa Pada Lagna? How do you calculate? Most softwares actually calculate the Upa Pada Lagna and give it to you. But if your software doesn't, then what you do is check your 12th house in your birth chart and check where the 12th Lord is placed in your birth chart. So for example, again, I'm just taking example of Aries Ascendant because it's much easier to explain. So Aries Ascendant 12th house is Pisces. So the Lord of Pisces is Jupiter. And if Jupiter is sitting in the fourth house, so it's sitting five places from itself. Jupiter is sitting five places from itself. So then from fourth house, you count another five places, which brings you to Scorpio. So the Upapada Lagna of that person is Scorpio. So now, if any of the planets that I mentioned before, and especially Jupiter and Venus, these two planets, like even if you leave other planets out, just check Jupiter and Venus. If Jupiter and Venus are transiting or aspecting your Upapada Lagna or your seventh Lord, then that also creates a um, really good time for marriage, strong timing for marriage. And the second thing is, sorry, the second is Dharakarika. So Dharakarika is the planet holding the lowest degree in your birth chart. So whenever you have the table, just see the planet holding the lowest degree. And that is called the Dharakarika. So Dharakarika basically represents your spouse as per Germany astrology. So again, any of the, especially seventh Lord, Jupiter or Venus, aspecting or transiting over Dharakarika. You know how like current tran uh, planets transiting over your natal planets in your birth chart. So for example, if your Dharakarika is Mars and it's sitting in your second house, in your birth chart, in your uh, natal chart, and then 
Jupiter is transiting that second house, then again, it's transiting over your Dharakarka. So it activates that Dharakarka and that is a good timing for uh, marriage. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to say here, um, some of you might be wondering what is all this alien language, Jaimini astrology. So James Braha uh, has given me the confirmation that this coming Tuesday, <laughs> he will do a session on Jaimini. So there he will explain. So those of you who are not understanding this, wait till I upload the video with James Braha on Jaimini astrology. So there he will there he will clear off all the basics but as of now you just get what she's saying <laughs> yeah or like even if you don't get to germany astrology you can also check through planetary transits and madarshan and Tizasha. it's like pretty much like 95 percent you'll get the results like it's like, um 95 percent accurate so now i'll just explain with the help of examples i have like some real birth charts um and then i'm going to tell you when they got married and what planets were transiting and so i have two examples one is early marriage and one is late marriage and we'll also talk about what causes early marriage and what causes late marriage so this is chart number one let me see yeah so this is cancer ascendant so most of the times like i don't want to generalize but since uh, for cancer ascendants and leo ascendants Saturn is ruling their seventh house. So whenever Saturn is the Lord of seventh house, it creates a delay. In this chart, Saturn is also aspecting the seventh house with his third aspect. So again, more delay. And um, Ketu is also aspecting the seventh house. So again, like Ketu is also, Ketu is a Karaka which doesn't like which makes you lose interest in that thing wherever it is so basically ketu is also aspecting the seventh house so there is there there is a significant delay in this chart and saturn Somebody is sitting who is also aspecting <laughs> mars manglik <laughs> classic this is yeah uh, like the person got married around 30 but they had been looking since uh, they were like 25 or something oh my god yeah if, if this is a indian chart then you can say this is a delayed marriage yeah and so they finally did get married um i'll show you and even in the navmansha chart no. saturn is sitting in the seventh house so again, Saturn, like there's a heavy impact of Saturn, like everywhere related to marriage. And also the Karaka of marriage is sitting in the sixth house, but it's not that bad because it's sitting in its own nakshatra. So uh, it is sitting in its own, Venus is sitting in its own nakshatra, but it's still in the sixth house. So they got married in the Mahadasha of Rahu and Antardasha of Venus. So again, Rahu, like I said, creates obsession. So Rahu like and Venus, uh, Rahu Madasha or Antardasha, Venus Madasha or Antardasha, it's a very like, even if uh, Venus is not their seventh lord. So Venus yeah, is not... Venus is the natural significator of marriage. So that can always happen. Exactly. So this person got married uh, in Mahadasha of Rahu, Antardasha of Venus. And funnily enough, um, their Saturn was transiting in Scorpio in retrograde motion and um, then because it went retrograde and then went direct so saturn was transiting scorpio at that time and jupiter was transiting virgo sixth house uh third house but virgo uh, sign so from the third house it's aspecting yes. the seventh house correct from the fifth house saturn is aspecting the lagna lord uh, the seventh lord itself is aspecting uh the seven uh the seventh house and moon was transiting uh moon again changes sign like every two days but i mean it just helps you like pinpoint like go to very yes. basic details but uh, moon was transiting um cancer at that time and uh moon was transiting cancer yeah the lagna, yeah. Moon, the I, lagna. Wonder, I wonder in which nakshatra they have got married <laughs> They decided, so they actually got married, but they like the wedding was like uh, finalized when Moon was transiting Cancer. So it was 
finalized. And even if you check uh, from Navmansha, like Jupiter, which is, she's a female. So Jupiter was transiting their Lagna at that time and aspecting, uh, and here Jupiter is also the seventh Lord in Navmansha. So again, you can check both the charts and see uh, how it works. Venus was in their uh, second house. So again, like 2, 7, 11, that's the biggest rule that you can follow. And um, funnily enough, for this person, Rahu was in the first house and Ketu was in the 10th house. What first house? Eh? Rahu, Rahu was in Cancer and Ketu was in Capricorn. Okay, okay. So again, so when like, they were married. Yeah, when, when the uh, wedding was like finalized. Oh, okay. So there are two things when Rahu... So for this person, Rahu was transiting their Lagna. So again, Bhavad Bhavam Rahu, but then Ketu is aspecting their seventh house already. So again, Ketu transiting the seventh house. Also, like Ketu is a planet of separation, but in this case, the marriage actually got finalized because Ketu was just transiting and Ketu in the birth chart is aspecting their seventh house. But I'm very sure that wedding would have been like, oh my God, finally I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was too, too many frustrations and uh, it was like the person had just given up on getting married. Exactly. There was another uh, girl to whom I was talking recently and she's a Leo Ascendant and she has Venus in the 6th house. And you know Ketu is in 6th house for Leo now in transit because Ketu is in Capricorn now. Mm -hmm. And the other day, this was around six months back, she was telling me, oh, I have given up hope on relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something interesting here. I, like we were discussing yesterday, if you remember, mm -hmm. <laughs> the seventh house in Navamsha. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you see there's a planet sitting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. will have a lot of say in your marriage, wherever that planet is in the Lagna, go back and see that. So if you go to the lag, so, the, so Saturn is sitting there in the 7th house of D9. That means he will have a tremendous say on marriage. Mm -hmm. Then in the Lagna, he is sitting in the 5th house. And there are so many planets and it is also ruling the 7th house. Mm -hmm. And the Lagnesh is aspecting this planet. So this, this can happen because it is the 7th Lord and the 8th Lord. It can happen that most of the proposals were been cancelled from the side of the in-laws or i mean the other party you know eighth house is your in-laws seventh house is your partner mm. so your partner and his family or the i mean this is the chart of a girl i guess yeah it's a girl yeah so uh, before her marriage who how many of her proposals she must have seen mm. it could have happened that the boy and their his parents have created some issues because yeah. Saturn is the uh, seventh and the eighth lord. <laughs> and also, like the boy that she got married to, even the uh, the boy's parents were not ready. Even there was a problem in that. Ah, there you go. It works so beautifully. Yeah. But um, here the Lagna Lord is also involved. You see, mm. so yeah. that means the, the there was that was. There was a problem from the other side, but it was also her own decision to not marry these people. <laughs> she herself is also involved, you know, but uh, suppose the fourth Lord was involved, then it would be her mother who would say, no, no, don't get married to this person. He's, he doesn't look good. He doesn't earn good, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I don't see Venus is involved here. And nor do I see uh, Jupiter is aspecting, but it is not very directly involved so i don't think there's issue any issue from the side of her parents mm -hmm. the issue is from the in-laws i guess yeah and by any chance because this mahadasha is of rahu and in nadi there is a rule that if the mahadasha or antadasha planets are either saturn rahu or ketu then there is a big difference in the culture of both the families so by any means is that is, was this an inter-caste marriage or inter-religious marriage or something like yes. that? The guy was from a different country. Ah. <laughs> but thank God the Antardasha planet was not Rahu, Ketu or Saturn. Yeah. Otherwise that have been that would have been too much there would have been too much difference, you know. Yeah. 
That's true. Nice. Venus is it's a very good planet to get married. 